You know, it's always been a dream of mine to put fish in this pond one day. Part of the five-year plan, I guess. But for now, it's just target practice. Later on today, Chef Dean, Elief, and I are going to go on a fishing expedition. And then we're going to build a smoker for fish out at our farm here. After that, he's going to help me with an incredible salmon salad, smoked salmon timbali with fresh pea shoots and chive and potato cakes. Sounds good to me. Oh, jeez, I think I got a big one. Go! Oh! Whoa, Tina! Whoa! Oh, boy! Many have compared my organic farm to the beauty of a painting. But there's nothing more beautiful to me than watching the growth of a new season coming up in the fields. Since we practice certified organic farming, we don't use pesticides, so we must pay careful attention to the quality of soil outside in the fields and inside in the greenhouses, where we grow dozens of varieties of greens and sprouts for our popular and delicious salad mixes. Pea shoots, also known as pea tendrils, a little bit different than what the restaurant trade calls pea sprouts. These are cut from a growing plant rather than the entire shoot. This is uh, the best variety that we grow for pea shoots are sugar snap peas and in particular an heirloom variety called dwarf gray sugar. And it's well named because the leaves have sort of a grayish cast, beautiful little red margins around it. They've got a beautiful burgundy and light blue flower that you can use as an edible garnish in your salads as well. Mm. It's a lovely taste of spring in your mouth, that lovely, even sugary taste from these sugar snap pea shoots. And I really like them because they're first crop in the garden, an early reward in the season for your gardening efforts. Another early crop in our garden are chives. These cousins of the onion family are in a way another dual purpose crop because the flowers, when they do open up in early spring, are also edible. They've got a beautiful lilac purple color. And you can break them open and spread them on salads or on soups. When the flowers have finished blooming, cut them off the plant so that the energy gets diverted into producing more and more of these beautiful stalks. And when you are using chives for cooking, don't go all the way right down to the end. You've got enough of them in your garden anyway. Just use the nice green portions here. And last but not least in our early season meal, we have fingerling potatoes. Now I love these potatoes because they have a really firm texture and waxy flesh. And you can tell these are still great for eating because they haven't developed sprouts or eyes on them yet. So they're still really nice and firm. Once they do develop eyes, they start getting a little soft and mealy tasting. But these beauties are still great for the potato cake that Dean's gonna make tonight. Rusty cedar in hand, it's off to the greenhouse to fire off some pea shoots. Sugar snap peas are just like snow peas. They're both edible potted, except sugar snap peas have nice plump little peas in the pod, and I think they're a lot sweeter too. The variety I'm seeding in the garden today is called Sugar Sprint. Now the idea with sugar snap peas is to try and stretch out your harvest period. And you do that by getting a number of varieties. Sugar Ann, Sugar Sprint and Sugar Daddy all mature at different points of the season. This is what we're going to do with our sugar snap pea seeds today. In order to get our dual crop, we're going to plant them twice as close together as the packet normally says. So instead of doing rows 18 inches apart, we're going to plant them 9 inches apart. In about another 10 days, when the pea shoots have come up off the ground, we're going to go in and harvest every other row as pea shoots for our salads. We're going to leave the ones we want to develop into sugar snap peas in the row undisturbed. That way we'll get two crops off the space. Plant sugar snap peas about an inch in the ground. If your weather in the spring is very cold and wet, don't plant them too deep, otherwise they'll rot in the soil. Peas need a lot of water to germinate. Okay, sharpen your scissors in about 10 or 14 days and you're gonna be having the first crop of sugar snap pea shoots. Now when you grow pea shoots at home and for edible sugar potted peas, you're gonna be doing the same thing that I do on the farm, just on a smaller scale. On the farm, I use one of these big wheel hoes, but at home you're gonna use one of these stirrup hoes. The main thing you have to do is plant your peas directly into the ground because they don't like growing in containers. It's too warm in the summer for them. 
Plant them in straight rows directly in your garden and make sure you space the rows enough so you can get one of these hoes in between them. The stirrup hoes are about the fastest weeding tool you can use on peas and I can go in really quickly and efficiently. Now these are the pea shoots that we're going to be using for Dean's Salmon Timbali Salad tonight. They're out of the ground about 10 days. When you harvest your pea shoots at home, you have to be very careful how you pick them and I'll show you how here. When you cut them, you're looking for the growing point, which is this part right here, and the first set of leaves that come off it, cut it just below that. And what you're left with is a nice tendril and a bud. If you go too far down the stalk, it'll be too tough. And save some for yourself. Mm. Oh, it's sugary. Hey, Dean. Hey, Anthony. How are you? Good, how are you? We're good. good to see you. Did good. you bring the equipment? I got the barbecue. All right. Dean and I are working on a special little handyman project in the shed for tonight's dinner. So, uh, Dean, have you ever smoked salmon before? Yeah, but I didn't inhale. <laughs> A line like that will get you an office one day. <laughs> so uh, we've basically gutted Dean's barbecue. So we've lined the bottom with some stone tiles so that uh, it'll absorb the heat a little bit better. We're using some apple wood because it's got a nice uh, fruity fragrance. Watch your eyebrows. Basically, we're just using old uh, throwaway stuff to make this. Dean had the barbecue, I had the cooler, and uh, it was really just going to the store, hardware store, and getting some laundry ducting to uh, to finish it off and some duct tape. Well, why don't you go take a look see if we've got any smoke yet. <coughs> oh yeah, <coughs> we got smoke. <coughs> oh yeah. <coughs> Looks like it's gonna work fine. Can't wait to try this baby out and go fishing tomorrow morning. Before we do that, I've got some chives to weed, some clover to check over, and then off to the river for some fishing with Dean. Organic farming calls for some creative thinking to solve problems like pests and weeds and to improve the quality of the soil. That creative thinking includes letting Mother Nature do her work. Now this lush looking field of clover here are one of the tools that organic farmers use to put nitrogen back into the soil. The great thing about clover and other legumes like alfalfa, they can take nitrogen from the air and fix it in a form that plants can use in the soil. They have a bacteria that lives on the roots. After two years, I'll plow this down and it'll return as much as 140 pounds of nitrogen per acre to the soil and my crops will grow and benefit from this. It also, it's so nice and thick that it'll keep the weeds down. So when I do plow this down, I'll have a nice clean field to grow my vegetables into. You can roll me in the clover any day. The organic farmer was a rare species until recently. As a result of breeding programs, there are now more organic farmers than ever before. With the help of computers and sonar, we are able to understand more of their vocabulary. Approach with caution, this species grows in the wild. The chives are a wonderfully fragrant, delicate, perennial member of the onion family that comes up hale and hearty in my garden in the spring of every year. It's the first thing to come out in the spring for me. A couple of strategies on how to deal with chives. Because they're a perennial, you're going to get lots of weeds in your chive bed. So, a few techniques. My favorite tool is this Chinese hoe. It's a broad hoe. And you can go in and knock off the dandelions that are going to appear and the mustards. But, sooner or later, the dandelions are going to start blowing into the chive plants themselves. Other weeds are going to come in, so then it's time to divide them up. And that's when you got to put your back into it and get the shovel out. Then take our spade, dig up a clump along with the weeds that are in there, and the toads. <laughs> I'll put this little guy over here. Okay, so now we've got our chive clump out. We can take some of the weeds out of it. The dandelions have a big tap root, so they're pretty easy to pull out. Twitch grass is another perennial weed. 
So we'll get all of the weeds out of there. So we're left with nothing but chives. Then take our spade and divide the clump up. Okay, last dandelion, that looks pretty good. Now that we've got the chive clump cleaned up, we're going to take it out of the former bed and put it into a new clean bed that we've prepared for transplanting. And give yourself about a foot between plants so you can get in there with the hoe and keep the weeds out. And now your chive bed should be all right for the next two to three years. Now the restaurants love it when we bring our chives into their kitchen because they're so fine and delicate. But I'll tell you chefs, they don't grow that way. We have to pick them that way. And here's how you do it. Take a good handful. And now it's time to play pickup sticks. The big ones, they're the first to go. They're too thick for a lot of the chefs we supply stuff for. The burnt tips, we don't like them either. Now these are chive flowers. These are also edible. When they open up, you can cut them off the plant and break them up and sprinkle them on your salad or in your soup. It's a really lovely garnish. But when they're in balls like this, I get yelled at by the chef. So out they go. Grab them by the top, shake out the rest of the stuff. And what we're left with is a nice, delicate bunch of chives that any chef would be proud to have. Worms are great allies on any farm, conventional or organic. But on an organic farm, you have even greater numbers of them because there's more weeds, more plant material for them to feed on. And that's just what they do that's really good for your garden. They'll take plant material that's on the surface, they'll take it down into their burrows, and then they'll break it down into a form that the plants, the vegetables that you grow, can use. In addition, these big worms, the night crawlers, their burrows go down a meter into the soil, and they open that soil up for drainage. And they do it all under cover of darkness while you're in bed. It's just the quietest rototiller, most energy efficient rototiller you can possibly have. So when your garden's healthier, you'll have more worms. When you have more worms, your garden will get healthier. These guys are going to give up their lives for my fishing expedition today, though. After getting all dirty, it's bath time for Antony. You know, our farm is so organic, we don't even use rubber ducks in the bathtub. Girls, do you know the song about soap? Should I hum about four bars for you? <laughs> Yee-haw! It's fishing time. We're gonna catch us some salmon. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yep. yep. I don't think we're gonna catch anything here today. No. But I have another plan. What's that? You got any at the restaurant? I got one. The girls will never know. Well, let's go get that. All right. All right. Free up this. <laughs> when we come back, Dean will show us how to fillet and debone the salmon, and then we'll smoke it to make the salmon timbali. started the smoker and it awaits the fish that we caught in Dean's restaurant. All right, Dean's more of a golfer than a fisherman, but uh, he's an expert when it comes to filleting fish. So uh, Dean, why don't you show me how to tame the beast? All right, so I use a serrated knife to take it off the bone. Try and keep the fish as flat as possible. Watch fingers. Yep. Uh, now the idea when we're getting the fish ready for the smoker, we're actually curing it with a sort of a Gravilax solution. Yes, salt, sugar, a little booze, some spices. Um, you can put any herbs in there that you want. So it's going to sit in the uh, the brine solution for about 24 to 36 hours. These are these are pretty big size, so I think we'll do we'll do 36 hours for these ones. Okay, once it's out of the brine, we dry the salmon, pat it dry for another day. That's right. And uh, how long would we leave this in the cold smoker for? Uh, I don't, I like to be able to taste the fish, so I think probably three hours is, uh, is what I'd do. Well, that looks gorgeous, Dean. 
All right. Now we'll uh, take this back to the house and put it in the brine. Make sure. Right. The salmon sat in the brine for 24 hours, and then we put it in our sure. cooler smoker. Okay, so three hours later? Good. It gives me the time to look in on a new friend of mine. I love the idea that we share our organic farm with the other birds and animals that inhabit this land as well. And right here in the middle of our field, Mama Kildeer decided to put a nest with four eggs in it. But uh, I've seen her sitting on the eggs, so, so we're going to move our tillage equipment around her, give her the space she needs to raise her four little babies. I'm just going to check on the salmon. It's almost ready, it just needs another hour. Well, I got my organic pea shoots, organic chives, fingerling potatoes, and the salmon that Dean and I smoked in the smoker. I can't wait to try that salad he and I are gonna make this afternoon. All organic, all farm fresh. It's gonna be great. When you make a meal that's just got a few main elements to it, you better make sure that they're top quality ingredients. And to me, this chef today, Dean Elieff, stands for top quality. He won't stand for anything else. So we're going to be doing a smoked salmon salad with uh, pea shoots from our farm and black truffle paste. I can't wait to see what that's going to be like. And uh, potato cake. So uh, Dean, let's get going on the salad. This salmon's the wild salmon. Whenever I can get my hands on it, I'll use it. It's a, it's a real treat, yeah. and uh, the flavor's great. It's better texture, better flavor. It's, it's comparable to using your greens uh, versus something out of the grocery store, so. Wow, That's, it looks beautiful. Here. No, it's, it's undeniably Gorgeous. better. I notice this is a lot less smoked than you see in the stores when they offer smoked salmon up. This is a real, you can see the fat glistening on it. Yeah, I, I try not to. Uh, mask the flavor with too much smoke, it just mm -hmm. enough to accentuate the flavor of the salmon. Right. Put the salmon into the bowl here. All right. And I uh, see you've got some other ingredients now. Uh, lemon zest. Yep. I'm going to put that in. Nice. And uh, black olives. Black olives. And some chives from our garden. They're really, really nice and pungent in the spring, huh? Now this, this is... Uh, this is black, black truffle, truffle paste. Okay. So you can get that at most uh, specialty stores. Just olive oil? a bit of olive oil just to bring the whole thing together. Okay. Put a little salt, a little pepper. Yeah, you're getting a nice mix there of uh, the lemon zest, the chives, and the olives, and the saltiness for the salmon coming through. And the... All right. Let's work on the vinaigrette then. Okay. This part I know. We've got um, shallots. Now these are shallots from our, our garden from the root cellar, actually. We've been keeping them all winter. They store a long time. They don't come chopped, though. Unfortunately, no. no. I'm trying to grow them that way. And a little sherry vinegar. I like a little dash of salt in there as well. Okay. Just to uh, whisk then... that together. And we'll dress the pea shoots. Now these, these aren't seasonal anymore. We can grow these just about 12 months of the year. In the winter, I grow them in the greenhouse. And in the spring, they're the first thing I put into the ground. These are uh, dwarf gray sugar. It's a really old heirloom sugar snap pea variety. They're a nice uh, sort of tender pea shoot, not like uh, the larger commercial big potted varieties are gonna give you big tendrils. I think they'll meet your standards for quality. Good enough. Okay, so we're just gonna dress these up. All right. so if you can put a little salt and pepper on there, I like to season the, the greens. Oh yeah. Bring out their flavor as well. Okay. All right, mix that up, see if that's got enough vinaigrette on it. If you were in my kitchen, I'd break your arm off for using tongs with those. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to find out what Dean does with the potato cake, and we're going to plate this whole dish up. It'll look fantastic. the salmon timbali. Dean, show us what you did with these potato cakes. All right. They're a basic potato cake recipe. We just julienne the potatoes. 
Uh, mix them with some chives and salt and pepper. Put them in a pan with uh, with some butter, mm -hmm. and we put them in an oven until they're until they're golden on each side. Draw potatoes. Yeah. Now I'm going to cut the uh, potato cake. This is the timbali. No, this is a timbali mold, uh. also known as PVC pipe, <laughs> available at most plumbing stores. So I'm going to get you to put some of this uh, salmon mixture right into the timbali mold. Oh, it sounds good. So about an inch up? Yeah, that's about right. Even a little bit more. Okay. Okay, now just pack it down a little and remove the mold. Don't crush it. Oh, nice. Okay, here All we right. go. If you've done this right, the mold's coming off and the salmon stays there. Oh. That's oh. just fancy. <laughs> so, the potato cake goes on top. Then I'll get you to put some salad greens on top of that. Are we going to garnish it? I think so. We put a little bit of uh, chives and black olives in there. Good. So to reinforce the elements of the dish, exactly. and it looks like a winner. All right. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Oh, come on. Hey, you should have seen me reel it in, though. I just wish we could like have. Like a pro. Some gorgeous salmon, Anthony. Perfect. Wow. This is a perfect meal for today. You know, we got the fresh pea shoots in there. Nice little blast of spring and the chives. And a good salty mm. edge with like, the olives. That's right. Mm. It's a harmony of flavors. It's it really great. is. The picnic gazebo along the banks of the river was a perfect spot to enjoy the salmon timbali with my wife Tina and Dean's wife Patty. It's times like this that I'm reminded how the strength of flavor in organic foods brings out the strength of friendship over an organic meal. Until next time on The Manic Organic, I'm Anthony John, a man outstanding in his field. Mm -hmm.